Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this live training event from Conservation Careers. My name's Nick Askew from Conservation Careers. Thank you for joining this webinar, where tonight we'll be exploring postgraduate training for careers in wildlife conservation. Now, you're all here because you want to spend your careers conserving wildlife, and I salute you for that. You know, as a result, I believe you deserve the best career support uh, and training that we can offer you. Now, you might be here because you're one of uh, two or three different types of people, I guess. So firstly, you might be an undergraduate. Perhaps you're studying currently something related to wildlife conservation um, and you're planning your next career steps. Welcome. Um, you might be also job hunting. OK, so you might be trying to understand what you need in order to speed up um, the job hunts to get hired quicker. And you want to understand whether postgraduate training, whether it's a master's, a postgraduate certificate or a diploma is right for you. Um, welcome also. Or you might be a career switcher. You might be doing something working in a totally unrelated sector right now um, and you want to get more kind of career insights into what does the sector look like, um, what is the different pathways into the industry and whether postgraduate training is right for you and whether it's needed. Welcome also. Now we get asked all the time at Conservation Careers, do I need a master's degree or similar postgraduate training in order to work in conservation? And it's a really Simple question, I guess, to ask, but it's quite a hard one to answer. And tonight we're going to start trying to unpick that for you. It largely depends upon whether your, um, your target role, your chosen niche, if you like, requires a master's degree. What are the entry level requirements for that role? Or maybe, maybe the mid level requirements if you're looking to switch across from a mid career into a mid career. Um, and also your experiences to date. So there's no one size fits all. It's very much dependent upon your particular context and the role you're looking to secure. But it's worth bearing in mind also that conservationists are, they're an educated bunch. Okay, so we did a survey five, six years ago at Conservation Careers where we asked around 150 professional conservationists working in conservation across the globe, not just here in the UK, but globally. We asked them, one of the questions we asked was, what was the highest ranking qualification that you have? Okay, and the survey respondent stated 19% had PhDs, so doctorates, Okay, 42% um, had postgraduates, their highest training, so a master's diploma certificate. 34% um, were undergraduates as their highest level achievement, and 6% were school level. So looking that in the round, 61% of professional conservationists have a postgraduate training or higher. Okay, so they're a clever bunch. So certainly it's an important aspect of working in a really competitive sector, which is why it's important why we're looking at this this evening. Now we just launched a new area of our website where we listed about one and a half thousand training courses, a lot of masters and postgraduate courses, but degrees and online and short courses and other things also. And in today's webinar, what we're going to do is explore the pros and cons of postgraduate training for careers in wildlife conservation. We'll be exploring questions such as what are the different types of postgraduate training opportunities in conservation? What are the benefits of doing postgraduate training? How can you choose the right course for you? Okay, and what are the typical career paths or prospects following such a course along with other things? I'm really excited because this is the first time we've had a panel on a conservation careers webinar. So joining me, we have three course leaders from two of the top universities in the world. They are going to share their insights and their views on postgraduate training. Now, I'll introduce them in a minute, and then they'll introduce themselves also. But before we do that, I'd really like to hear from you guys online. I can see we've got nearly 50 people online, which is wonderful. Um, so if you'd just like to kind of use the comment, you should be able to see a chat wall in there. If you could just say hello, you know, where you are, that would be wonderful. So I'm Nick. I'm in the UK. Feel free just to kind of let us know where you are. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of how the webinar is going to run. OK, and then we'll get into the meat of it. So in a minute, our panelists are going to introduce themselves. OK, tell us a little bit about themselves and, and the courses that they lead. I'll then open with some questions to, to the panelists where we'll be exploring the different postgraduate training options and how it can help your careers. And then I'll be handing over to you. OK, so we'll be um, providing lots of opportunity for you to ask your questions to the panelists and to get your answers um, from them. So feel free to start thinking and formulating your questions. Use the comment wall for the questions, OK? And then when the time comes, we can dip in and start answering those questions for you. It's really nice to see a few people online. Let me just say some hellos. Who have we got online here? We've got Katie from the UK. Hi. And Hakim, also in the UK. You've got uh, Marin in France. Welcome. Christina in Germany. Hi, Christina. I think I know you. <laughs> Welcome. 
Amy in San Diego, you're winning the distance competition so far, as far as I can see. Alice in Bristol, Lucy in France. Uh, Cape Verde as well. Wow, welcome, welcome. Elfman in Nigeria. If, if I know you, Elfman, it's really nice to see you online if you won the blogger competition last year. Welcome. Okay, well, it's really nice to have so many people online. Um, so what we'll do then is I'll pass over and introduce our three panelists and they'll tell us a little bit about their courses and then we'll go into the kind of the meat of the webinar, which is all about questions and answers and exploring postgraduate training. So on the webinar this evening, we have three course leaders. We have Dr. Chris Sandbrook, who's the course director of the Masters in Conservation Leadership at the University of Cambridge. We also have Dr. Chloe montrez Strebens, uh, who's the course director for the Masters in Biodiversity Conservation and Management at the University of Oxford. Uh, and last but by no means least, we have Ada Grabowska, Grabowska, sorry, Zhang, course director for the Postgraduate Certificate in Ecological Survey Techniques, also at the University of Oxford. So maybe if I can pass over to you guys one by one, if you can just give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself and your courses, that'd be wonderful. And maybe I'll start with Chris, if that's okay, and pass over to you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nick. Um, so as, as you said, my name's Chris Sandbrook, and I'm the course director for the Masters in Conservation Leadership. Um, which is hosted in the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge, but is actually a very interdisciplinary program. Um, I myself have an interdisciplinary background, I've trained in zoology initially, but um, have my PhD in anthropology, and I've been working in, in geography for over 10 years now, kind of on the relationship between conservation and society, particularly looking at those issues in the global south. Um, the master's program itself is a, a one-year full-time course which is targeted at um, mid-career conservation professionals. So we're looking for people who've already got you know, three to five years of experience in conservation and they're looking to kind of step up to that ne next level of leadership in their, in their careers. Um, and it's designed to give them the kind of applied leadership and management skills that they need to be really effective agents of change in conservation as well as having the kind of cutting edge interdisciplinary academic training that they, that they need. Um, and the way we deliver the course is uh, through what's called the Cambridge Conservation Initiative. So we have, um, we're very lucky to have in Cambridge um, this initiative that brings together um, 10 institutes at the University of Cambridge plus nine internationally focused conservation organisations and networks, which have been working together for over 10 years and are now um, kind of co-located in one large building called the David Attenborough Building. And our students are able to benefit from all these different practices and academics who come and teach them on the work that they're doing and then also host some of their projects so they can put some of what they've been learning into practice. Fabulous. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, and I can vouch it's a wonderful course. We do a bit of career coaching as part of the course each year, and it's great to kind of see the, the international element of the students that you have, actually, the sort of 20 or so students are from across the globe, are they real mid-career kind of uh, conservation changes? Yeah, that's right. so I, I, yeah, I should have should probably said that. We've, we've had, um, we have about 20 students here, as you said, and in the 10 years the course has been running, we're now up to 80 different nationalities from around the world, and you know, 17 or 18 different nationalities in a cohort, and only one or even no British students. So it's a, it's a really kind of a global program. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you for your time and for joining this webinar. Um, Chloe, if I could hand over to you, please, if you could introduce yourself in your course also. Sure. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I'm Chloe Montez Trevins, and uh, I am the course director for the Biodiversity Conservation Management Masters here in the School of Geography in Oxford University. Um, I have had uh, um, various um, jumps and leaps in my career, having started, uh, I suppose, the usual academic track as an undergraduate in zoology from Trinity College in Dublin. And then um, pursuing my graduate um, degree, post uh, doctoral degree uh, here in the University of Oxford, um, actually in mathematical ecology, mm. which uh, was highly theoretical. And uh, for a taste of something more applied, I jumped ship to the policy world, uh, working with uh, the United Nations Environment Programme, World Conservation Monitoring Centre based in Cambridge. And then, um, uh, following a, a period of missing the world of research and um, um, teaching, I returned to Oxford and uh, took up a postdoc uh, in the zoology department looking at agri-environment policy. And from there, in about nine or 10 months ago, I joined uh, the Biodiversity Conservation Management Masters as their course director. 
Um, and so um, we have uh, also got a very interdisciplinary course. Um, we are based in the School of Geography within the Social Sciences Division, but benefit greatly from uh, very strong links with uh, the wider conservation science research groups across the university uh, in the zoology department in this um, in the Martin School, um, Oxford Martin School, and well, as well as the interdisciplinary um, Centre for Conservation Science. Um, the, the objectives of our course are really to provide an understanding of biodiversity science and the socioeconomic political, cultural and institutional environments with which, within which uh, management and policy decisions are made. Um, we have a, a one year course for our Masters of Science as well as a two year course for uh, an MPhil, which uh, the difference being that uh, for the Masters of Science you have a year composed of two ter terms of taught courses followed by a one term research component. For the uh, longer MPhil programme, you uh, extend that research pro project to the following year um, and then are required to submit a larger thesis of research. Um, some of the things that we do over the course of the, the year, um, we encourage uh, students, class sizes is normally around 26, so all of our classes are very interactive. Um, students are encouraged to engage in, in teaching with the with the with the lectures directly um, and so we encourage people to critically engage with the concepts and theory in biodiversity science um, across various different disciplines describe how and by whom space is prioritized and governed for conservation over time critically assess the ways in which conservation builds and extends its power um, and explain the emergence and performance of different modes of governance we uh, work on uh, the role of ethics and values in producing culturally uh, attuned conservation interventions. And we explore the world of technology and how it is um, uh, evolving uh, within conservation science and pushing the barriers of what we know and what we can do to implement change. Um, fundamentally, uh, we have a strong theoretical component to the course, um, but this is then linked through to hypothesis and methods and data through your dissertation project to develop a more um, a comprehensive understanding of how um, biodiversity science uh, can be advanced in the future. Fab, fab, thank you. Sounds like an exciting course. Thank you for the introduction. And then over to Ada, if you could also, if you could just keep a, a fairly brief, if we can, so we can get through as many questions as we can. Give us a, a brief overview of your course as well too, please, Ada. Of course. Um, so my name is Ada grabowska Zang, um, and I'm the course director for Postgraduate Certificate in, in Ecological Survey Techniques. Now, both of those things are a bit of a mouthful, so I'm <laughs> going to briefly go through this. So um, our course is a postgraduate level course uh, which is run typically over a year, where, and it's part time, um, and um, it's a it's a um, it's a course in which people can get um, um, really nice exposure to uh, first of all postgraduate level study, but also practical um, applications of the of the of the um, sort of methodologies that are used on the ground in ecology and conservation. Um, so, for example. It's a um, what we call a blended learning approach, where you've got a mixture of um, um, uh, learning in the field, where you uh, come to beautiful Oxford and we take take you out uh, into the field and um, teach you introduction to some of those surveying techniques, and we've go go through a wide range of uh, taxa to introduce uh, people to. People who um, come to us sometimes have uh, experience in one or two groups, but rarely all of them. And we also um, um, have an intense geographical information systems um, uh, course during that week. Um, after which we've got a series of online modules. So people can go back home um, and, and do these. These are tutored courses. Uh, they require um, um, sort of postgraduate level or levels of uh, reading and assessment 
so these are assessed uh, courses, and uh, they're centered around different taxonomic groups, so surveying uh, different taxonomic groups. Uh, we also have a, a module on um, data analysis in biology. Uh, so this is, um, again, an assessed course which uh, introduces uh, um, the concept of uh, data and uh, data storage, data analysis and statistics. Um, and, um, and we've got different taxonomic groups that then you can learn about. We've got vegetation, um, then we've got um, um, field techniques for surveying um, mammals and reptiles, uh, then birds, uh, then uh, together we've got fish and amphibians and um, um, invertebrates. So for people who want to um, specialize, and you need to take two of those are compulsory. Um, and so that's um, vegetation and data. And then you can choose out of um, uh, the remaining modules uh, to suit sort of, sort of um, your um, career goals. Um, know, Great. That that's wonderful. Actually, maybe the first question, maybe I can kind of stay with you, Ada, in that case then, because... Um, you're doing a postgraduate certificate. The other guys are, are leading a master's program. Yes. Can you just like paint a picture of like the different types of postgraduate training opportunities out there, so, so people are, are clear of the different options. So, um, um, postgraduate certificate, I would say, is uh, probably the, the um, um, lightest version of your of your postgraduate training. Um, I, I, I tend to call it sort of half a master's, but it's a, 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 a tiny bit shorter than that. Um, so um, think about it as a, the, the, the same level, but uh, less, um, it's the same level, but less duration. Mm -hmm. so, like you would have um, a, a training of full time for a year for a master's, you have that uh, um, um, exposure for a year, for a year um, but part time, so as students are expected to do about um, uh, twenty hours of, of study a week. You can also have um, a postgraduate diploma, which is a little bit um, again mm -hmm. it's, uh, ramping up a, a little bit of the um, of the time spent on it. So sort of maybe two thirds of a master's um, mm -hmm. uh, is, is is that's what it's sometimes quoted as. Um, and then and then and then you've got you've got the masters which. Um, um, you know, um, uh, kind of the equivalent of, of, of a year full-time study. Fabulous. That's really clear. Thank you, Ada. Uh, uh, opening to all three of them, whoever wishes to pick it up, you know, why do people choose to take your courses? What are the benefits of doing postgraduate training? You know, would, would one of you like to kind of, you know, talk around that subject, please? Well, I can say that from our part, uh, a lot of it is uh, because they're looking to specialise in conservation science. So, and they're they're seeking that um, sort of uh, more focused uh, view of res of that of this this field. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of their undergrads will have been much more broad and will maybe have contained one or so. Um, set series, lecture series or modules, uh, whereas this is focused for one or two years. Um, and the other thing uh, that we find, particularly with uh, undergraduates coming from British universities, is that uh, until they reach this level, they will often have been siloed into social sciences or into natural sciences. And these masters offer an opportunity to um, really work in this uh, interdisciplinary world, pulling theory expertise from across the different disciplines and apply it to their chosen field of study. Right, okay, great. I, do you have anything to add to that, Chris, as well? Or do you feel that's kind yeah, of. Well, just. Uh... I completely agree with what Chloe said about that kind of interdisciplinarity, which often is lacking in the undergraduate program, certainly in the UK. Um, just one point just to add to the to the previous question about kinds of, uh, of study. I think it's perhaps worth highlighting that there are um, in the UK system that master's degrees themselves can kind of broadly be described in two different categories. They're kind of taught master's programs, which will have a, a heavily taught element with perhaps a shorter research dissertation or project at the end. And then there are kind of research focused master's programs, which often have less structured teaching, a longer uh, dissertation element, and are perhaps more seen as a kind of preparatory step to go on to a PhD. Um, and then also in other countries, of course, they have different systems. So for example, in the US, a master's would typically be two years rather than one. 
um, and it, it's different in every different country around the world but that's our, our kind of British system that we're all working in. Yeah thanks for covering that and is that the difference between an MPhil and an MRES is that what you just described here in the UK? Uh, it's not quite as clean as that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a can of worms. Yeah. An MRES definitely has that research focus and then other universities just have their own kind of wonderful terminology for different things. Okay, fabulous, thank you. Our MPhil is a taught program, but we, we tend to call it the Masters in Conservation Leadership rather than the MPhil because no one knows what an MPhil is, including me. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> me neither. <laughs> if, 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 I can, if I can add something, I, I think uh, for our course, people who... Um, uh, people who apply they're really looking for um, to um, uh, excel in, in the practical aspect of ecology and conservation work because mm -hmm. um, even people with a recent degree in biology we we um, kind of find that um, we, uh, we get people in um, uh, applying for for our course who have got a master's um, on course at the moment we've got two people with PhDs um, and they and even though they've got higher level uh, level of training um what they want is actually that practical methodological rigor and maybe maybe they would have specialized in a very very small narrow um area on how to survey rivers but if if they if they want to go into the wider sector they need a little bit more in their toolkit and this mm -hmm. is what we're looking this is what we provide i can't just just quickly jump in there that very similar um with our masters we've had quite a few students who have phds and already have masters and i think that's partly because it's not really on this kind of track the kind of mm -hmm. hierarchy from undergraduate study to masters and on to a phd on a research track it's it's for people who are really looking for that applied management and leadership training because they're, they're perhaps they're finding themselves in a role in their career for which they don't feel prepared. so you know they've got that really excellent technical skill from their previous study and their, their research training and then all of a sudden they find themselves leading a team of people, managing large budgets, having to do fundraising, and they just don't, don't have the skills that they need. And then they, they, they find themselves then looking for, for further training. Do any of you get people who are these kind of, you know, career switches I described at the beginning, people working outside of conservation, maybe mid-career doing something unrelated, they're looking to kind of, you know, to flip into wildlife conservation ecology or related through going through a kind of postgraduate training like you guys um offer is it something that that you you kind of support the career switcher yes absolutely um we, get, we actually get um quite a few career switchers so um these will be um um people who um for example work in a um consultancy um a sector but perhaps not in ecology or not in conservation right and their passion is to work so at the moment on the course we've got a person who uh works in city planning for example um and uh, we've got people with business degrees um and they are really looking for uh this kind of uh, bridge between what they maybe um thought they wanted to do um aeronautic engineering we've got one a, a person with a with an uh, with a degree in aeronautic engineering mm -hmm. And, um, and they, they just want to bridge their skills so that they can um, find a career in something that they, that they feel passionate about. Right. So the, there's someone here, um, Katie's asked, uh, what happens if I have no experience? I'm a drama teacher. What can I do? Would you take people with literally no experience, Ada, or, is it, or there needs to be some background or related experience to, to go through a course like yours? So, uh, do you know, uh, during admissions process, we are looking for evidence for a real for for a passion for the subject mm -hmm. so even if you don't have um paid experience you know or kind of a, a professional experience um we would be looking for evidence that um for example you 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 are passionate about conservation mm -hmm. and that you maybe have volunteered with the conservation organization and uh, uh um did some work um, not necessarily, you know, uh, because you were paid to do so, or not necessarily in surveying, um, but um, something that would have um, given you the experience of what is going to be like to study for our course, mm -hmm. um, and what is going to be like um, working in the sector, because we we don't we, we don't want to really um, give people um, false impressions. 
um, and 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 we don't we can't um, um, show them what is going to be like after they finish our course. So it's so we so we're looking for uh, people who are um, very convinced and very certain of what they're mm -hmm. they're looking for. And I think the evidence of having done something, um, if it if it's volunteering, if it's you know a, a lot of our students, for example, have volunteered with a local wildlife trust. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that is very good evidence that they're passionate about conservation. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, Chloe, Chris, do you have switches also? And what do you look for for people coming through your courses that have been doing something unrelated? So I think we're a little different from um, both Ada and Chris's uh, courses in that we have off, every, most years got quite a, a large number of uh, very early career conservation um, scientists and practitioners. Um, we frequently get people straight from undergrads um, and although in our uh, admissions process we neither we don't have any emphasis on on one particular criterion we look at a fairly holistic um, uh, view take a fairly holistic view of, of a person's profile and it includes academic um, criteria and professional experience and vocation. Um, that said, because we have some early career um, uh, applicants, we look across all different uh, degrees. Uh, we have uh, on our course at the moment, 75% of so of people with natural sciences degrees. Um, and the others come from all different disciplines. We have arts students, we have economists, we have business graduates um, and everything in between. Um, and I think for us, along with the uh, cultural geographic diversity of our cohort, that really enriches um, the experience. Um, mm. And although it is in at least the first two terms are um, intensive taught elements um, of the course, it's actually some of the experiences that people will have with their peers, the discussions that they'll have, the networks that they'll build, um, that really uh, creates a, a fantastic learning environment here in the course. Yeah. No, that's, um, that's... In terms of career switchers, maybe fewer perhaps than had increased because we mm. don't perhaps have fewer mid-career. Um, and those that come mid-career are typically those who have had a lot of field experience are then looking to move more into the world of policy and decision making and so on, or back into the research environment. Um, that said, uh, we, can, we do get people who are working in, often in, in related fields, maybe in sustainability and supply chain management for corporations maybe working in engineering and starting to look at how new technologies might be applied to conservation science. This year we have a geneticist who worked extensively on red kite introductions um, and has come to us to learn a little bit more about the sort of uh, application through policy and decision making of, of some of the, the evidence and uh, scientific methods. Right. And as someone who sees red kites fly past them all day, every day, <laughs> it's nice to hear that the work these people are doing is having a great impact, you know, the world around us. Fabulous. So I've seen a few questions dropping in. That's great. Please do add your questions in and we'll start touching on them now as I kind of see them coming through. Um, and I see also, Chris, thank you for answering a question in the stream. That's wonderful. Uh, there's a question there for you, Chris, directly, actually. So, um, Chris, you, uh, blah, blah, blah. I've been out of the academic world for eight years now, almost exclusively conservation related professional positions. Would you accept solely professional Oh, I just lost the question there. There it goes. Actually, and I've, I've, I think I've already answered it, Nick. So um, you have. Okay. Well, that's fine. Too specific. That's fine. I just, that's can fine. I just, just, just say very quickly about the career switches? We do get some, and the key for us is that they have to have several years of professional experience that that can be described as relevant to conservation. But for some, that's in the corporate world or you know something not in a kind of classically a conservation job. But yeah. Like they have to, they have to demonstrate a real passion for the field and that and convince us that they're going to take this as their career from here on yeah and they have something that's re relevant to leadership so whether that's existing leadership skills and experience or a kind of trajectory that suggests there'll be leadership positions in the future great okay and a, a question to the three of you then related to that and you may have already covered it chris i don't know but what do you look for 
you know, when you're shortlisting applications, what should people do to stand out from the crowd? You know, what are, what are some of the things, are there any tips you can give people that would help them to have a greater chance of, of being accepted onto your courses? Yeah, so um, I think a really important thing is to look very, very closely at the, the kind of what it says on course websites and information about what we're looking for. And um, if you can demonstrate that you've really closely looked at and understood our program and can give a good answer to why you want to come on this particular program and not other ones. It's something we often ask about an interview is, you know, why this course? And some people, it's pretty clear that they haven't really even looked at the kind of titles of your modules and that kind of thing. And I'd say that uh, that's a bit of a mistake um, if you're looking at these programs. Um, yeah, as I said, we look for people who have, who have plenty of experience professionally and can really convince us that they've reached some kind of a, a, a maybe a blockage or a need to kind of shift up a gear in their career and they're going to help have a big impact. We're perhaps a little different, I think possibly also from, from Chloe's program in that our academic requirements are not as high as you might think. So, um, you know, they're kind of equivalent of a two one from a UK university, but in some cases with people who've got a really outstanding track record and potential, we can go a bit lower than that. So, um, you know, if, if someone, have particularly you know perhaps been to a university in a, in a country um in a part of the world which doesn't have quite such a strong educational system um, we can often make a case that you know their their qualities are sufficient that they should be given a chance for, despite not having you know a, a top class degree from a world-class university because i think it's important to say with all of us on the panel you know uh, conservation postgraduate training is not exclusively the preserve of oxford and cambridge um, you know, there are lots of other really really good institutions in the uk and elsewhere doing similar work yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And maybe Ada, if I can go over to you, like, what do you look for when you're looking at applications? Are there any things that you know, you're sp specifically looking for? So uh, we're really looking for, um, you, uh, you know, um, our entry requirements, we um, have to have a certain um, 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 kind of threshold, but um, we take this holistic approach, kind of like what Chloe um, said before, mm -hmm. in that we have taken people without a first degree before. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they've got such a mass of um, professional and field experience, um, and they they've um, and they um, uh, just need extra skills. Their their skill is maybe uh, lacking in the in the um, academic rigor of of what they have been doing. Um, and they just need to skill up in that. Um, and this is what we can offer to them. Um, on the flip side, the, the, there might be people who have got, um, you know, recent um, um, undergraduate, uh, recent, recent graduates um, who are actually have got much less experience uh, um, in, in the field or in applying the methodology, uh, but they've got a good track record of um, academic study. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we, we really um, um, take a mix um, and um, I think what we're really looking for is um, sort of evidence that, uh, that someone is passionate um, about ecology and because our course is uh, very much focused on, on real life applications of, of these methods, um, um, that this is something that would be beneficial for someone in, mm -hmm. in Term. so it's it's sort of you know i don't I, I sort of tend to think about it as a matchmaking process mm -hmm. um because because you know we want to give people the skills that they actually need so they need to tell us what skills they have and what skills they need to achieve what they want to achieve and then we sort of make that decision i mean sometimes for example if we um really can't make a good case that that a person um, um, can, can, can be accepted on the certificate. Um, all of our individual modules um, are, um, are available as standalone short courses. Mm -hmm. so, well, actually, we, we, we don't have enough evidence from your application um, that, that uh, this is a good match, but um, you are welcome to take a short course um, with us and see if that suits mm. And then, um, and, and the good thing about, about our course is that then that module, so long as you take it for credit and you, and you complete the, the assessment, that can then be incorporated uh, when you later decide that the postgraduate certificate is for you. And we've got more, more evidence of your, um, um, your ability from your assessment. 
um, then you can incorporate that. And so it's like a stepping stone at that point. Yeah, sort of try before you buy almost. <laughs> uh, almost, <laughs> almost like that. Yeah. So yeah. because because we we really want to um, um, sort of allow people to um, to to do what they really want to do. Hmm. So long as that there's that match, um, yeah. We're, right, great. Right. Thank you. Um, the three of you have quite different courses, and I think we can sort of hear that. You know, you're you're, you're serving different types of people at different stages in their career, also. Um, and Chris, you mentioned also, you know, one of the things you ask people when they come through an interview is, is you know, do they understand the course? How did they select it? You know, do they even look at the modules or not? What sort of questions? This is an open question to all three of you. What sort of questions? should people ask themselves when they're trying to find the right course for them? You know, are there things that they should be bearing in mind when they're kind of filtering through what is quite a big list actually of potential training opportunities out there to try and find the right one, the right, the right match that you just described out as well. Uh, for me, I think um, thinking about what it is that you don't have that you want in order to have the career that you're aiming for, so um, if it is a case that you're looking for practical skills, field skills, then maybe ADA would be a better uh, course to take. If uh, you are um, sort of developing your career, you've got a lot of experience, then uh, Chris will speak more, but uh, I suspect uh, that uh, sort of that training in leadership and, and uh, so on is, is, is going to be right. And in our case, um, if you are looking for a better understanding of the theory, if you're looking to explore concepts and engage with them a little bit more deeply, um, come to get to grips with the complexity, the um, cross-disciplinarity of the topic, um, and think about how um, these theories can be applied uh, in practice, um, either through policy making, through the advance of, of uh, conservation research, development of evidence um, bases, um, or uh, um, yeah, uh, working within the corporate world and the development of new markets and engagement with uh, decision making for various different stakeholders, then uh, sort of that would be our course. So thinking about, as I say, what it is that you don't have that you want to get um, mm -hmm. is probably your first step. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. It's, it's advice we often give people too, which is understand what it is you're trying to secure, see what they're looking for, what you already have, and then it gives you the gaps and it tells you whether you need training or not, and it might tell you specifically you know, where it is you'd like to go for that training. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe one thing you've got, I think almost the reverse of that, which is just to think about where you want to be you know what's your sort of five year ten year career goal and then mm -hmm. what program that's going to help you get there and um you asked in your kind of introductory or you said in your introductory comments nick that you know you don't mm -hmm. whether you need a master's to get going in, in conservation and i'm really often asked whether you need a phd um mm -hmm. perhaps to get to a slightly more senior level and um you know one of the things i think is really difficult is often people feel that they need, you know, those two letters before their name to be doctor, somebody to be kind of taken seriously and given a, given a really senior job. And actually the skills that you get from doing a PhD may not be the ones that you need to do that well. Um, and doing a PhD is a long haul. It's hard work. You know, you've got to really be passionate about the thing that you're studying. Mm -hmm. And so I always really, you know, advise people to be cautious about embarking on a PhD just because they think it might kind of get them through a hoop to, to get a different kind of job. You know, doing a PhD is something is, is absolutely necessary if you want a career where those research skills will be required. But you know, if, if it isn't, maybe there's a way around that that you could do a master's like ours or, or there are other courses now emerging which have that kind of applied leadership and management focus. And then you can convince employers that, look, I've got those skills that you think I might have got from a PhD, but I've done it much more efficiently in a one year program. And, uh, and I'm ready to be employed at that level because, you know, we've all seen people who get into the late stage of a PhD and it's not really for them and it's quite a painful experience for you know, yeah. concerned. Yeah, thank you, yeah. It's interesting to think actually, so coming out of your courses, what are the kind of career paths or the prospects that you typically see people go, you know, once they leave your course and go back into the real world, if, you, if I can put it that way, you know, what, what, what are the typical jobs, roles, yeah, career prospects that you're seeing coming out of your courses? 
So I'm quite lucky. Um, our alumnus office actually uh, have been busy at work pulling out various uh, stats and numbers on where our um, alumni go to. Great. Um, and something like, and, and there's going to be uh, some margin for error in here because of job turnover and so on and so forth, but um, somewhere around two thirds, just over two thirds, um, go into uh, public sector roles, NGOs or business, mm -hmm. and the remainder tend to the, go into research mm. for us. Interesting. Um, within uh, government and, and NGOs, uh, we have um, a, a really very fairly wide reaching um, uh, sort of scope or, or mm -hmm. a range of things um, across the world. Um, mm -hmm. Include Conservation International, WWF, UNEP, um, IUCN, um, and, and many, many others. Um, All the uh, and within um, within the public sector, uh, again, uh, people go into um, uh, decision-making bodies, um, policy advice, and so on, in a wide range of countries across the world. Many, many, many of uh, those that go into uh, government roles uh, are actually non-UK uh, students returning to their uh, home native countries and entering into the public service. Great, thank you. No, good, nice to hear, and thanks for the stats as well. We appreciate that. <laughs> of all three of you, I'd expect it from you probably, so. <laughs> uh, um, Chris and Ada, could you add anything more to that? Where do, where do your um, alumni tend to go to? Yeah, so um, most of our alumni, uh, being international students, they mostly turn home to their to their country of origin. Although a fair few have stuck around in Cambridge for a few years, um, a few have gone on to do PhDs, but that's definitely not the the, the, the big majority of the of the, of the graduates. Um, and they've gone on to uh, you know really impressive senior leadership positions in in mm -hmm. NGOs in particular, but also in in governmental and intergovernmental organisations. Uh, uh, a very small number in a, more of a kind of entrepreneurial or private sector role. Um, but I think partly because so much of our teaching is kind of oriented around a, a, an NGO environment that we have in Cambridge. A lot of the people who come to us are from that world and we're kind of remaining in that world. Although we're increasingly seeing um, students coming in from a governmental background. So people who work for their, you know, for their ministry of the environment, or they've been involved in a, a management role in a national park or something like that. Um, and so some of them are now in, in really you know, impressive senior roles, like we've got the, the Deputy Commissioner of Protected Areas in Guyana, for example, is one of our mm -hmm. um, several people running um, uh, NGOs, but also some working at very, you know, what, what might be thought of as less glamorous careers, but where they can really put their leadership skills into practice, you know, successfully leading a local project somewhere where it's really needed. So you know, I think it's, you know, it's important that, to say that we, you know, we don't think of leadership as being something that's associated only with a position of authority. It's about somebody who can really influence people and bring about change, and that operates at lots of different levels. Ah, thank you. Yeah, so interesting to hear and see where your guys are and where they're going to be as well, sort of five or ten years down the road. It's um, it's, it's, it's really fantastic because we we've had a similar um, story where people. Um, it just um, get the, 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 they sort of get a leg up. Um, from from our course, and one of our students um, got so this is an, an, an African student who got um, uh, promoted even before he finished his course because our, because our course can be done alongside full time work. Mm -hmm. um, um, we've we were um, uh, told to add the light that he's been um, uh, uh, promoted to the head of his government department um, um, uh, while on course. Um, and then people go back and, 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 and do a lot. Um, so a lot of people who come from a management, so for example, uh, national park managers, reserve managers who come to us, they um, come back with a more science-based management approach. Um, so they go on to um, either um, um, further their career in the, in the sort of uh, reserve management sector um, um, or um, they uh, so they sort of employ it so they work differently or they um, take on a more senior role um, um, likewise we do get we do get about 20 percent of our um, students who go on to do a master's and these are usually people who uh, kind of kind of miss their vocation originally and they've got an undergraduate degree 
uh, in something completely different and they want to um, go on and do a master's or a PhD um, um, but they need that methodological background mm. um, so um, uh, so there's about uh, about 20 percent um, going to do further study um, and go into research um, and the, my, the majority will be um, um, will be um, uh, recruited in the environment sector so they will be uh, going to a consultancy they'll be going to work into um, NGOs and that depends whether they're uh, from the UK or not um, in the UK uh, we find that um, people uh, exposing people to the network um, of practitioners of ecology practitioners uh, gives them a real um, advantage because they get themselves known as someone who is on that course and uh, because they do practical applications they need to do they need to do a field project and if they um, uh, cooperate if they collaborate with uh, for example um, their um, either their local government or, the, or or an NGO during their research then that make they make themselves known as a professional in the field already even when they're on, on course Fabulous, thank you. I've just been reading some of the comments too as well. We've been given an outline of careers prospects and uh, there's a bunch of really nice questions in here and, and Chris and others you've been answering them which is fantastic. Um, Christina here asks around funding and she said what kind of funding is available for, well she's asking about the, the conservation leadership course that you do Chris but I think I'd like to broaden that out a little bit more actually and ask, um, obviously courses are not cheap, they're a big investment of time and money. Um, do you, are you aware of like funding, support, scholarships, bursaries, whatever it might be to, to enable people to come on your course if, if funding is an issue for them? Yeah, so um, it's a huge question. Um, we're mm. in a fortunate position with our masters that we have a, a number of full scholarships available, um, but particularly for students who come from countries in the global south, and that's, that's not of any value to, to British applicants. Um, who ironically actually can find that there's less funding available for them than there is for students who come from what you might think of as, as less you know, well-off backgrounds because of the mm -hmm. scholarships that are available. Um, and then there are other scholarships kind of within the central university that people can apply to um, and, and you know, hope, hope for some success there. Uh, and I think actually it's worth making the broader point as well, but this is a huge problem in conservation, which you know, you're only too well aware of, Nick, in the role that you're doing with conservation careers, which is you know, that a lot of the time it's this chicken and egg situation where people need some experience to get employed or they need a degree to get to feel that they're going to get employed and it costs money and only certain people are in a position where they're able to volunteer or, or live locally enough to a, to a potential employer to come and do some voluntary work. Um, and that that is a huge sort of selective pressure on only a certain kind of person to be eligible to get into a conservation career often because they're already quite well off and well located. Um, and that means that conservation is missing out on some amazing talent and mm. in fact continuing to be a, a not very diverse sector um, in terms of socioeconomic backgrounds, which is a, a big problem. So, you know, we've been trying quite hard um, in our building in Cambridge to, to not offer unpaid internships, for example, so to only have internships that are paid um, so, that, so that they're available to anybody. Um, and of course, that perhaps means there are fewer positions available, which might mean even more of a bottleneck, but at least it takes away the kind of unfairness aspect of, of expecting people to work for free in order to get into the conservation sector. That's great. And it'd be great if other organisations followed suit too. Yeah, it's wonderful that you know, Cambridge Conservation Centre are, are leading by that. Um, so our situation is similar to um, Chris's in that um, we get scholarships for African students. Mm -hmm. Um, through um, um, uh, through benefactors, um, but uh, um, it, it, it sort of uh, students may find that um, UK students actually have uh, uh, fewer scholarships available to them. Um, the good thing is that um, because you're not studying full time, then you can do it alongside the job you already have. Mm -hmm. um, um, if you're um, um, fortunate enough to, to, to have one, we can do a part-time job and, um, um, and do our course. Or even, in fact, uh, you could um, uh, do the job alongside, you know, uh, when you're about to finish a career break. For example, we get a lot of career switchers who, you know, have um, women who have finished um, or, or are about to finish bringing up a family and they want to get back into their career or they want to switch career um, and... Um, do it that way.
Yeah, great. I, I saw some questions in the comment stream. They're also about career breaks as well. So thanks, you sort of related to that nicely. Chloe, just to kind of just to swing back to you to give you an opportunity to talk about it. Is there funding available? Are you aware of any funding schemes if, if that is something that um, uh, you know would be of interest to people? Um, so funding is one of the primary barriers to, to, to doing a master's program. Um, we do have a number of scholarships available, um, many of which are um, operated central, centrally through the university. So um, you will be introduced to the different opportunities at the point of application. Mm -hmm. um, quite a few of them are focused on Global South. Um, but uh, we offered we we'll offer a couple of small schemes for um, students from from other nations applying to the course. But it should be said that those, particularly those small schemes, they won't cover the full cost of the course. Um, and unlike Ada, ours is a full time intensive course where working alongside it is often simply not an uh, uh, an option, or at least not working in any major capacity um, alongside the course. So it is, it is a, a very big commitment um, and uh, the uh, reasoning being that it uh, offers you an opportunity to move your career uh, somewhere that would, would otherwise be possible. Um, so it's sort of a, a forward planning um, career resilience uh, step. Uh, thank you. Well, we're coming to the end, really. We've got about five minutes left. Um, so I'll try and ask a few more questions from my comment stream uh, before we wrap up. Um, Christy Ann, um, hey Christy, asking the question of you, all three of you. Thanks for all the information you shared so far. As successful academics, what advice would you give people who are looking to follow in your footsteps? There's more like general careers advice for academics. You three are all doing well in your careers. Um, what advice would you give someone who's looking to follow in your footsteps? Who's going to be brave enough to answer that one? I think well, uh, Chris answered that a bit earlier, and uh, I think it was uh, very, very true. Um, I think there are um, uh, three components, and all of which I agreed with. The first is uh, develop your competency, either through this kind of degree or through professional experience. Uh, the second is um, have a good bit of luck. Um, and the third is, you know, be the best, uh, work hard, commit to these kind of courses. Uh, they are short and intense. Um, they will throw an awful lot at you in the course of a year, but uh, commit yourself to the course, take it on and do your best. And, and it will, along with um, the other uh, elements, offer a reasonable chance of, of converting into some professional advancement. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, uh, the academic world is particularly harsh in, in how sort of pointy the triangle is, I suppose, that if that makes any sense, that they you know you can have 100 plus people in, a, in, a, in an undergraduate cohort, you know, becomes 20 odd people in a master's cohort, becomes five PhD students, two postdocs, and then ultimately one person makes it as a faculty academic. You know, it's a, it's a very, every step of the, the, the process, uh, you know, there are only a relatively small portion of people will, will be able to kind of carry on through. Um, so it's a, it's quite a, you know, as, as Chloe says, it's a, it's a question of, of, you know, working hard and being good at it as much as possible. <laughs> and I would, I would, I would second that. And I, I, my advice would be to just remember that there's um, more than one path to being a successful academic, uh, because I've met so many people who have um, sort of, um, Meandered is the wrong word because it's, uh, it's, it's quite kind of like you're purposeless, but, um, but the, the, there are skills that you can gather in other fields that we, would make you arguably a much more successful academic than um, if you sort of follow, follow through, through the, what was termed as the pipeline, which always, always makes me think of making sausages, <laughs> which, is, which is not very pleasant. Um, and um, and it does it does take a, quite a lot of luck, um, and um, I think open up to um, um, different opportunities because um, success looks different in different fields and for different people, um, and um, and ultimately the extra skills that you might gain 
actually make you more competitive because uh, if everyone else followed through the pipeline and you bring um, 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 experience from uh, governance or even management, uh, those are very valuable skills. Yeah, thank you. Fabulous. And that's it time wise. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I've been looking at the comments, we've answered as many as we can. Um, I've, I've seen quite a few comments asking specifics like, do you know of a GIS course or a veterinary course or how much does your course cost, things like that. I mentioned at the top we've launched a new era of our website where we have uh, nearly one and a half thousand courses listed. Chris, Chloe and Ada's courses are all on their feature at the top. So if you want to find, find out more about their courses, feel free, free to drop here. If you go to our website, you'll see a menu item now called training. Click that and away you go. All the courses are there and you can find out as much as you want. We have many GIS courses and others in there um, and it's free to view. Just go in and have a look. As part of the launch of the, the courses that we did this week, we're actually searching for the top conservation training opportunities or courses globally. So if you've been on a course, whether it's a short course, it might be an online course, um, or another type of course, it might be a master's or a degree or similar, a postgraduate certificate, a diploma, we'd love to hear your views and your ratings. Find the course, give it some feedback, give it a star rating, give it a review, tell us what you thought of it. That'll help other people find the right course for them. Um, we're also looking for recommendations of courses. So if you jump in and find that a course you've been on that you loved is missing, tell us. We'd love to have that course in the mix too. Anyone who reviews or recommends a course, a training opportunity, all shapes and sizes will get into a free prize draw to win um, a place in our Conservation Careers Academy. So just jump in, give us a rating or recommendation and that will help kind of grow the set. Thank you again for joining everyone online, all our participants. We've had around 50 people online the whole time, which has been wonderful. We'll make this recording available for you guys to watch again. And people who have also registered and want to watch it will be sharing that very soon. A big thank you to Chris, Chloe and Ada for sharing your time, your knowledge, your expertise. It's been really nice having you on the call. I've really enjoyed myself. I hope you guys have as well. Um, yeah, we'll be sending the recording out soon. So it's just really for me to say goodbye. We'll see you on the next webinar. And uh, thank you again. All the best, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.